Professor Sumit Sarkar is one of the most prominent historians of modern India. Passing out with a PhD in 1970 from the Presidency College of Calcutta, he came to teach in the Department of History in Delhi University. His first major work on modern India was his PhD thesis published in 1973. His books include Swadeshi Movement in Bengal, 1903 to 1908, Bibliographical Survey of Social Reform Movements, Modern India, 1885 to 1947, and Popular Movements, and Middle Class Leadership in Late Colonial India. In 1985, he published a collection of his essays called Critique of Colonial India. His latest book, published from Oxford University Press, is Writing Social History. This book is awarded the Rabindranath Smriti Puraskar, 1998. We have invited Professor Sumit Sarkar and young scholar Savita Singh to discuss the book, Writing Social History. This book brings us in the middle of the most contemporary discourse which is going on not only in history, but in the social sciences as such. Professor Sumit Sarkar, how did you come to think of uh, starting in a very polemical way as far as this book goes? Well, about this book, uh, one thing has to be stated right at the beginning, that it is really, it began its life uh, not as a book, but as a series of articles published in particular contexts and initially not with any plan of making it together into a book. But then after some time, thinking back about what I had written and certain other things that I was planning to write then, it seemed to me that there is a kind of an unity about these essays which are now collected together in this book. And this is an unity which has been given it by a combination of changing circumstances both in India and internationally as well as alongside of that changes uh, in my own ways of thinking. I think that provides the broad context. More specifically, on the one hand, you have developments say in India from the late 80s, early 90s onwards, typified by, if one has to mention uh, two striking things, the kind of movements that lead up to the destruction of the Babri Masjid and the coming to a position of ascendancy in Indian politics of forces that I would like to describe as the Hindu right. And on the other hand, you also have other tendencies at work in the country, including uh, various sorts of so-called lower caste affirmations, the Mondal issue and so on. Internationally, these have been the years, very painful for, in many ways, for someone of my political predilections, if I might say, so put it. Which, of, is, which, uh, is, which is Marxist, is well, right? Well, Marxist, yes, yeah, certainly, Marxist, but of course, one can be Marxist in many different we'll ways. We'll discuss that. Yeah, we'll discuss so. that. But these have been the years of the collapse of, apparent collapse of international socialism of the Soviet Union and what many consider to be the final demise of Marxism. Now, I don't agree and perhaps part of the polemical note that you mentioned just yeah. now, Savita, comes from that kind of position. At the same time, I would immediately add that I don't think I've tried two things. First, I don't, I wouldn't say that this is an entirely, so to say, one-sided polemic. In the sense that I don't think that a simple return to old forms of what passed for socialism, a simple return to some of the, what at one time had been considered and described, and maybe they can be described as the dogmatic certainties of much of older varieties of Marxism, that all that can and sh or should be retained. Uh, so, there is a kind of a bipolar kind of but discussion in this book. In, this in book, particular, yeah. um, I do not know, I mean, in, uh, generally what has happened after so-called, I should not say collapse, but a certain kind of decline that has mm -hmm. taken place in the world today, 
uh, of all left hmm. thinking, yeah. politics as well as theoretical thinking. Yes. And the place that has, uh, the, the radical thinking, the other form of radical thinking that has taken its place is uh, Foucaultian, postmodernist, Sadian, as you, uh, you it would say, it, uh, mm. the, the polemic in fact begins with some of the shifts yes. that have taken place mm. in South Asian writing in terms of focusing more and more or adopting or taking um, approaches which have been propounded by, say, Edward Said. Yeah. Edward Said's Orientalism has been very, very influential, oh, yes. all mm. right. What is the problem with that framework? Now, let me put it this way. Because it is mm. radical. I mean, it is, it is not conservative. It is not retrogressive. I mean, it, it, uh, apart from the fact that it homogenizes, as, as you say, many categories of thinking. Now, you see, uh, Operating with terms or opposites like radical, retrogressive is, I find it a little uncomfortable sometimes because one can be radical in so many different ways and one can be retrogressive also in so many different ways. And very often when you want to characterize the position of a complex thinker, including a thinker like Said, I don't think such a simple kind of formula would at all work. Basically my argument, to put it very briefly and simply would be something like this, that I see many positive things, not only in sight, but also something which is much broader and of which I am not very sure whether Said himself would consider himself to be a part, that is what you described by that very loose term postmodernism. There are many, I think many positive aspects of that to which I will return. But to start with the relatively more, what I consider to be the more negative aspects, I feel that uh, certain changes of intellectual moods have taken place connected ultimately though in indirect ways with the big global changes which we mentioned a few minutes, uh, minute, a couple of minutes back, which on the whole I would call unhelpful. I am not using a term like retrogressive, but unhelpful mm -hmm. both intellectually and politically. Among these, I would say one would be an extraordinary emphasis on what is called culture more and more abstracted from material conditions, uh, economic and yeah, political structures. Yeah. You do not like their ignoring the contradictions which exist within the structure of society. Exactly, but also ignoring, uh, avoiding or moving away from even detailed discussions of such structures right. operating rather with very, as you said, homogenized global categories. Now, this kind of culturalism I find to be a kind of a mirror opposite of what I also consider, I have considered for a long time, very unhelpful, mm -hmm. that is the economistic, narrow economistic kinds of readings of Marxism which collapsed culture into a simple kind of reflection of material conditions. Mm -hmm. And repeatedly I think in today's thinking, one is moving, one is beginning with a very legitimate kind of uh, dissatisfaction with older patterns of thinking. Then in a curious way, you are almost reproducing that through inversion. Yeah. Now inversion in a way does not change things. It just turns them upside down, but the problems but remain. They, um, they brought it to our view. Hmm. I remember myself reading Foucault's uh, Discipline and Punish and I was so full of excitement. Well, so am I, I still am, I would not use the past tense. I think mm -hmm. that is a, a very major work yeah. and great work. They, mm -hmm. they, they brought it to light, I mean Foucault single handedly I think did this great uh, service to intellectual understanding that there are various other forms of dominations. It is not only that the state uh, dominates, it is not that only communities dominate, it is not that these structures are only source of oppressions as it is called, that we ourselves do it because we inter internalize them and the production of knowledge and power uh, falls together with the production of a self which self surveils. These kinds of deeper analysis obviously Mm, has impressed many historians, say for example, Partha Chatterjee. You mentioned his book, his name many, many times. Yes. 
and you seem to be arguing, criticizing him for, for turning all sorts of uh, discourses into derivative, reading too much into colonial discourse and so on and so forth. What, how, how complex is this time period within which, say, for example, we write our own modern Indian history, say 19th century Bengal that you've been um, mentioning in this book? How complex it is, how much more, how more complex it is than for this framework uh, to, to sort of really bring it out? Well, so Vita, you have raised a whole series of points, mm -hmm. and I'll try to disentangle them a bit. Right. Because one of, since you mentioned homogenization yourself, I think there is a great danger in homogenizing, uh, so to say, Foucault and Said, and even more maybe Foucault, Said, and Pastor Chatterjee. Let me begin with Foucault. I would agree very largely, though not perhaps entirely, with what you, the uh, plus points, to put it crudely, that you mentioned just now about mm -hmm. Foucault. I think he's been, on the whole, a very fruitful influence, and as you rightly pointed out, he did help to bring about, uh, bring about very significant changes by broadening the scope of discussions of power beyond what had been its major foci earlier, that is in liberal political thinking, a concentration on state versus individual liberty and so on, mm. and in much of Marxist thinking, a concentration on economic exploitation, class exploitation. and that. Um, along with lots of other things, has been a very positive and a very liberating uh, feature. I think there are still major problems in Foucault, particularly in uh, with regard to the question what scope Foucault leaves for possibilities of transformation. In it's not that Foucault doesn't talk about resistance or even in some ways glorify it, but Partly, I feel, through a not unnatural dissatisfaction and disillusionment with socialist and communist movements, of which Foucault at one time had been a part. He was, a, after all, for some years a member of the French Communist Party. A disillusionment with forms of so-called actually existing socialism perhaps contributed to his evolution to positions where he seems to imply or argue that while resistance takes place always, yet if resistance becomes too effective, it always tends to create new forms of power. I think this is a possibility which is very much there, about which it is important to guard ourselves to re recall this. At the same time, this can lead to a very pessimistic or a very, uh, so to say, sporadic uh, notion of resistance, a move away from possibilities of transformation into a kind of virtual cynicism. But, and that is important, I think the comments I made about culturalism, taking culture in isolation, mm -hmm. that does not apply much to Foucault. In fact, the strength of Foucault has lain in uh, the way in which he has gone into the nitty gritty of formations of power knowledge in a whole series of fields virtually unexplored, at least from this point of view earlier. Uh, madness, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the birth of the clinic, yeah. discipline and punish, mm -hmm. sexuality and so on. Which side, secondly, I think we see though some, uh, I mean, Said's own position vis-a-vis -vis Foucault has often been described as highly ambiguous. Yes, yes, that is uh, right. But without going into those complications, I think on the whole, there is a simplification taking place. There is a tendency not so much maybe You mean to say that our reality is so much more complex? No, I don't, I, I wouldn't just call complex. So let's put it, I, no, mean, right. I mean, complex by itself does not add very much to an analysis. What I meant was that the critique of colonial discourse, which Said inspired, tended not so much maybe in Said himself as in the writings of many of his admirers, particularly in the South Asian context, to, uh, to sink into or get uh, engrossed in a series of 
binary opposites, polarities. And one element of Foucault that is the emphasis on the all pervasive nature of power knowledge that is coming into sight, but is coming uh, in a much simplified form without the detailed analysis of institutional and discursive structures which have been the strength of real Foucaultian analysis. What should it take? I mean, of course, the book, the book hmm. itself is, is an example of what it should take to write social history. But tell me for us, what, what, does, it, what does it entail really to, to do the kind of social uh, history that you are writing? I mean, you are very sympathetic to a view in history which is called history from below. And um, you have also been part of the earlier phase of subordinate hmm. studies and all that. What does it really take to write good modern Indian history? Well, that's a very big question. I don't know whether I can tackle it, uh, or that, uh, it's almost impossible to answer briefly, or perhaps at all. Yeah, well, let's but, try that. Yeah, but I would still say that the turn towards so-called history from below, which implied in early subaltern studies, and not just in subaltern studies, I've tried to argue in this book that initially it was part of certain world currents of radical history writing, part of certain forms of dissident Marxism, yeah. which, uh, Thompson, yeah, which right. particularly I think yeah. E.P. Thompson yes. typified at his best. Well, I think there was and there remains a lot of value in that. At the same time, certainly one has to go beyond that. I don't quarrel with late subaltern studies for go going beyond it or moving away from in it. Fact, I mm. I, I kept thinking that your criticisms were muted and that perhaps I have to grasp it much more by criticisms discussing Criticisms of? Criticisms of, 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 say, for example, even Partha's book. Hmm. I said, don't think they're muted. They're <laughs> perhaps over, <laughs> over polemical I mean, they were, they were, You were yeah. very, you paid a lot of um, reverence, and of course. Uh, no, and well, <laughs> I, have, I have great respect for Partha, yeah. both as a human being brilliant, and as a writer. Brilliant. But I don't agree with him. You don't agree mm. with him. Yeah. So that is what I'm, mm. I'm saying. Mm. What does it really take to, I mean, say for, still for, for you to celebrate E.P. Thompson well, and I would the present say, contemporary, mm, contemporary Because situation. I think he is dismissed quite often, much too easily. And uh, some of the themes, I, uh, I, what I did in my essay on Thompson was to tackle the various kinds of criticisms, some of them quite legitimate, which have been made about Thompson, particularly questions regarding three things, uh, whether the Thomsonian kind of history has not been overly Eurocentric, second, whether it has at all been aware of problems of gender, and third, the philosophical turn towards forms of relativism, of greater questioning of representations which postmodernism has encouraged, whether that does not blow up uh, Thompson, uh, show Thompson to be a rather naive thinker. And I have argued, rightly or wrongly, that these charges, except I think the gender aspect, where I would say he is certainly quite weak, uh, or uh, I mean uh, that's, that aspect is hardly studied, apart from a few late essays. But apart from that, I think many of these criticisms are wrongly framed. Largely because the trouble with Thompson is that you have to read the whole of his rather massive corpus, or much of I it, know. to You've really been appreciate talking about it. His because he is play. not a uh, kind of a precise, skilled theoretician. When he makes general statements, often he uh, in, uh, makes sits into fairly loose formulations, and uh, is also very polemical, which sometimes becomes a problem. But if we have the patience to go through his work in detail, we see that many of these problems actually is very much aware of. Can we just shift a little bit to 19th century Bengal, hmm. for example? I Which mean, will bring Patho back again. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily, suppose okay. we leave him out right, for yeah. a moment. Mm -hmm. But your chapter on um, uh, Ram, Ramakrishna Paravans hmm. and the notion the, the working notion, I mean, the com I, what I found very fascinating was that the complexity of the time and, and, and the population or the, or the class formations that had taken place, it was a very anxious time mm -hmm. for uh, intelligentsia, mm -hmm. 
and uh, the Bhadra Loga as it is, uh, as is, it is called. And there were two notions of time functioning together. The secular notion, the, as you said, the British came, the, the colonialism came with a clock. I mean, there was a conception of time, that the linear conception of time. And there was this circular conception of time, which was working on also the, cul the mm. uh, yuga, yuga mm. uh, notions of time. And you bring out so nicely, so beautifully, by going into the details of how um, the Bhadralok community used to come to Ramakrishna Parabhans and uh, they found all kinds of, um, they wanted to resolve some of the problems that they had, the tension that the modernity had brought about the world that was outside and the world that was inside and Pathar talks about that also. So just tell us a little bit more about okay. that. You see, one of the main forms such homogenization has been taking is, I would say, precisely what is perhaps a little implicit in the way you formulated this question mm -hmm. just now, a way of using terms like modernity, pre-modernity or tradition or what have you, as very aggregative terms. Throughout this book and elsewhere, what I've been trying to argue is the need to look at tensions, contradictions, which I would prefer to a somewhat vague word, complexity, because complexity you can say, I I'm prefer this word. you see complexity raises the problem that of course the more you go into details, the more complicated it becomes. Mm -hmm. And obviously you can't include all details, so somewhere you have to simplify, so where, where mm -hmm. are you? <laughs> Whereas it is a question of keeping an eye and an ear open or sensitive to tensions. Modernity, colonial modernity had numerous aspects and contradictory sets of hindrances and possibilities. Similarly, when, you, when we talk about the Vajralok or the intelligentsia or what have you, one of the important points that I think I have tried to make in several essays here is the need to distinguish roughly, tentatively between levels in middle class society. I think the role of relatively lower middle class groups has been largely ignored. Yet this is very important, particularly for a colonial middle class. We have tended to concentrate on a handful of very prominent figures whose writings survive, who have, many of them were undoubtedly very great figures mm -hmm. and so on. And despite the claims of subaltern studies to look at history from below. By the time we get to later subaltern studies, one does feel that there has been an almost a kind of return to elit elitism. For instance, mm -hmm. Pat Pathos' work <laughs> is entirely concentrated <laughs> on a series of outstanding yes. uh, uh, thinkers whom he calls nationalist thinkers. Incidentally, nationalist is another term which I would like to break up because there too, I mean, practically any colonial middle class person is described sometimes yeah. in thinking. There are a number of ways in which people yeah. have been nationalists. Mm. Yeah. But anyway, and it is in this context of lower middle class strata, mm. most of whom, many of whom have to survive through clerical jobs. That's all that get education gets them. And in these clerical jobs, the discipline of clock time comes in combined with the sense of alienation working in a foreign controlled office under foreign bosses, suffering the kicks and blows of that. Now it is in that social context that I think the early appeal of Ramakrishna partly could be located. This is not a complete uh, exposition of Ramakrishna's appeal, my analysis I think. The communalization that has taken place, how, how much is it historical in the sense how much there is a s historical sense to it? Because in the in the first in the introduction itself, you make a difference between historiography and hagiography. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't quite follow this question. I mean, how 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 much the communal mm. understanding that we have um, developed in our society? There's a communal, communal understanding of the past, of the past, of the mm. present, of of the of of nation state that we have there is also a communal view of that state mm -hmm. how far the uh, history is responsible for i mean historically how far it is uh, legitimate to say that it has been constructed over the years and nationalist history part of the nationalist history is communal and so on and so, so forth because there are a lot of people who are talking about it mm -hmm. you know 
uh, therein lies, I would say, the ahistoricity of this kind of so-called historiography, because what they do is to tear isolated passages passages, yes. individual passages from their context quite often and generally what has been happening is that certain assumptions which under various historical circumstances become quite deep seated in the 20th century above all the assumption of Hindus and Muslims and nowadays also I mean Christians are yeah, also exactly. being subjected to their treatment. Uh, as homogenized blocks, homogenization once again in a yeah. far more dangerous sense than what we were talking about earlier. As historical blocks, uniform blocks, existing more or less unchanged over time and engaged in relationships of conflict, inevitable conflict. Now this is a reading which a section of the present, so to say, is trying to impose on the past. And repeatedly, secular historiography has been able to show how mythified, how utterly erroneous so much of that is. Yeah. Last chapter is extremely important in this book. The whole book actually is very contemporary, very useful, very enlightening, and above all, very, very uh, timely. This book has to come at this point of time when as modern Indians we are in the throes of very, very complex political and intellectual processes. Thank you very much Thank for you. coming and being with us for Thank some you. time.